Song's over, now what? Somebody's gonna get some gems tonight, I promise you that. That's the only reason I'm here. Oh, that's the only reason I'm here. Somebody's gonna get some real gems tonight. So I took it back to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. So I go back to Rocky Mountain with this crazy idea of throwing these parties. I got with my friends at age 14. First party ever threw, we walked out of that building with $6,000 at age 14. So when I caught wind of that, I wanted to go to college. And I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't care about going to college for no education. I was chasing the bag. We all we have each other. So I went to Winston Salem State University, like my man Eli said, do some amazing, crazy parties. But guys, these times right now, these moments you're having, they're not gonna be here forever. So I noticed like those people who were with me, they were graduating, they were leaving. So I switched it up. And I went corporate, like he said, and I was promoted six times for four years. But I found out a lot of my friends were stuck. They didn't know what to do. So I wanted to kind of create something for them. I took a promotion that I should not took. I took a promotion, guys. I traveled. Anybody think about going corporate? I drove six hours away from my family. My family's in the front row, makes some noise. Woo! So I, I, drove, I drove six hours away from my wife, everybody. And what I found out is I had to stay up. And so I kept listening to this weird purple little app on the iPhone called Podcast. Who's heard of Podcast? I need y'all to make some noise. I got someone to tell y'all in a second, too. So I go off to the doing this podcast called School's Over Now What? And it's just grown up and it's allowed for me to network with millionaires to go across the country to LA, to New York, to Miami, meet with the big names like Grant Cardone and my left. And tonight I'm back here in the place where it all started for me, Western Salem State University. Let's make some noise. <laughs> I'm about to really turn up tonight because as I'm talking, this is a live podcast. Everything we're saying is being recorded. So a little bit about the podcast, it's completely blown up, guys. Anybody listening to this show right now is downloaded in 21 countries. We have over half a million downloads. So every episode is going to cross over 11,000. 11,000 downloads, guys. So I want to give you guys a gem before we kick this off. And if you got your phone, write this down. It's a gem. I'm just straight out giving it to you guys. I want you to know, whatever room you stand in, whatever room you stand in, make sure you know your audience, Make sure you know the people. Career. I got recruited to Winston. I'm a track coach. Um, and I, I didn't want to go to Winston um, until I came to visit the campus. And it was beautiful. Um, and I'm so glad I came here because I ended up going to ECU after for grad school. And I was the only black person in the room. Have, like, I was the only black person. And then let alone probably the only um, black female um, in most of the spaces I walked in. So I was so grateful to be in a space um, before I went to ECU where it's a lot of black people like me striving to be better um, because y'all can speak to this too it's very rare that you're going to see this type of like community and atmosphere again in the real world so where you're the majority and where people are specifically focused on making sure black people win so for me um, I went to a predominantly white institution for high school in DC, and the vibe that I got wasn't as uh, welcoming or uh, a place where I could thrive. Uh, so my goal was to come to an HBCU for college. So I had gone to a, a college fair at Howard University, and I met a young lady there who was repping for Winston State, State, and I had a great conversation with her. She kind of invited me to come to Winston. She was going to shadow me and show me around the campus. And uh, at the time, I was in a program called Upper Bound, and we traveled to North Carolina. We went to A&T, we went to Shaw, we came to Winston. And when I came, like, the campus, like the band, I saw the fraternities, the sororities, like all the vibes that I wanted to be a part of, you know, kind of sucked me in. And when I, when I applied, I knew I was going to come. Uh, when I got accepted, it was just, you know, uh, just all happiness. My family was happy, we traveled down together. Just being down here, just love, southern, southern hospitality, you know, good. This is really about, I would say, about the vibe, right? Yeah. And, and for me, I don't know what the ratio is that, but you know, people coming out here, the ratio is like 30 women for every one guy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right now, my pitching game is. If the ratio, watch out, man, teach the grass this. If the ratio is 30 women to one guy, you look at the stage right now, we only have one female on the stage. So, Taylor, being a female, doing the business you do, still living about Charlotte Vick. I don't know, like, what are any challenges to stand out as a female? Um, so, I'm a gym owner. I own a personal training studio in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I specifically cater to women. Um, I have two male clients right now. Um, I've been in business since 2014. Um, and, um, so last year I moved into a bigger space and now I'm looking for a bigger space um, because I want to be able to flip it into an event space. Um, because what you learn as a business owner is you do not want, if you have a building and you have a brick and mortar, you do not want it just sitting. It needs to always be making money. Um, and so right now, if I'm not training, I have another trainer, I have two office managers. If we're not there, then the bill, um, the business is just sitting. So I need, I need my money coming in <laughs> at all times. But um, I need my points, yes. Um, <laughs> But I, I get this question a lot because personal training is very like male dominated. Um, to me, I feel like when you're dope at what you do and when you're good and you're thorough, that you'll stand out in any room. And so that's never that's never a, a situation for me because first of all, I went and got my master's in it. So that like makes me stand out. Then I got my certification in it. I'm certified as a personal trainer and an exercise physiologist then that jumps me ahead. So now I can work in hospitals and clinical settings. And then I got certified as a fitness nutrition specialist. Okay, that jumps me ahead. Now I've partnered with different people. I work with different companies. Um, I've networked. Um, and I, I'm very intentional about the quality of work I put out. I'm very intentional about the quality of people I work with. Um, and I'm very intentional about always maintaining integrity in what I do. Um, and so, I, you notice the competition, like if I had to name some of the other trainers in Charlotte, I mean, I know them, you know, and um, it's very cordial, particularly the other black trainers, but I, I make sure I'm thorough. So when I, whenever I show up to any room, I'm very knowledgeable about my work, I'm very knowledgeable about my education, and I'm knowledgeable about my experience. So not to say that competition doesn't matter, but if you, you see a firm and you become great at your craft, you, you can walk in any room and be thorough. Mm -hmm. All right, right. So, the one thing I think is really important that you kind of touched on this earlier is acceptance. And coming from the HBC, what you guys will find out is you go out to the real world and you'll be yearning for acceptance because they might come from, you know, PWI, UNC, so as, I really want to ask Alex, and I want to ask Desmond, and ask you know, Aubrey is this, is that as you guys are yearning for acceptance, how hard was it for you when you go across the country and into China? Yeah, man, this is, this is difficult, because um, yearning for acceptance is one of the reasons why I left corporate America, first and foremost, um, because I felt like in that setting, um, I could never really be who I was. You know, I couldn't dress how I wanted to dress, and I had to be, you know, what they wanted me to be. Um, and so, kind of left that and understood that there was flexibility in me being my own in another country. But honestly, I think that acceptance in a foreign land is sometimes easier than it is in America. Um, I think that, one, they don't know where you come from, so you can just be genuinely who you are, right? So they're gonna take you however, if you wanna put on or just be yourself. So that, and then, I don't know, for me, I've always been adaptable to culture. Like, I mean, I come from, you know, our first generation American, my parents are Jamaican, so understanding, like, having that third world country perspective um, is something that I've always identified with. So I think that just allowed me to dive in um, a lot of people joke about it, but I used to literally just hang out with the locals, right? The Asians and being the markets and the rural areas and just kicking it with them because I knew that I wanted to learn everything on the business side, but if, once you understand the people, then you understand the business. Um, and so that, that, that was my perspective on it. Yeah. So for me, uh, just like Desmond, my family's from Ghana. Uh, so being in America, uh, first generation, you kind of go through a lot of different uh, trying to fit in, trying to be accepted by the people that in that are in your community. So uh, a lot of things that I did growing up was just to fit in. 
but as I grew older and I got comfortable with who I was and where I was from, um, everybody started to feel for that. They, they vibed off the, 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 the food that I ate or the culture that I brought to the table. So just being able to vibe in those surroundings was very important for me. And then when I saw Desmond in China, uh, the idea that I had a battery exchange uh, was hard to do in America, and having a conversation with Desmond uh, propelled me to apply to the program. And now we are, you know, the founders of this business that we started. And it was just through being who I was, uh, coming to the school that I came to, connecting with the people that were in my circle and outside of my circle. And now, you know what I'm saying, you see what we're able to do. You guys are here celebrating our success, and we want to come back and celebrate your success. So that's pretty much us. That's important is that, like, what I like about Battle Exchange, guys, is they took an idea and they acted upon an idea and now they're giving out value. There's somebody in this room right now that has an idea uh, on a, a product, a service, a clothing line, I think I heard say. You guys have done a lot of pitches. What's the biggest advice you could give this audience on how to make the right pitch? Yeah, I actually just read like a whole book about like just really, there's a science to pitching, right? And I mean, I think you actually noted too earlier as far as just like knowing your audience. So we go into a lot of atmospheres and, um, where at the end of the day, um, you'll have big audiences like this, but the person or people that you need to be focusing on is the judges, right? That matters. So a lot of time you have to work the room, you know, obviously you have some uh, audience buy-in, but at the end of the day, you just really have to focus your attention to making sure that you're triggering what they want to hear. So again, knowing your audience to where you can say stuff as far as like market validation that the audience might um, project to or really like, but you got to say the numbers and you got to say scalability and things like that, that, you know, really just target to um, the judges. Like the pitch competitions I've won is literally, oh, and the other thing I'd say is like the Q&A. Taylor said that, like, know your industry, know your business inside out. I've won competition strictly off of Q&A to where judges are asking me something, and I'm just on it, like, hey, we break it. That's out of people that work with you. Um, so for us, we have a technology company, so you need software designers, you need hardware engineers, you need people who can understand the business, people like brand ambassadors, students who can engage with other students. I think that's how you build a business, but actually working one-on-one -on -one with students or working one-on-one -on -one with people who have these expertise, you have to really understand where they're coming from culturally. You know, some people may be from China, they might be from India, so their understanding of time may be different, or uh, working with uh, individuals who may be who may be white or who may be um, just anybody else. You, you just gotta figure out how you kind of bring them into the fold and what you're doing, kind of lead them into what the company is working on. Um, I think that was the biggest challenge for us, kind of getting everybody engaged, but now everybody's falling in line and we, we, we're pushing the company forward. Uh, new kiosks are coming. We had a, uh, a heart attack <laughs> the other night because we thought we were going to have our machines, but God came through. So I think, yeah, that's just, just knowing who, how you uh, manage your team and how to bring out their best qualities. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot. Of, obviously, I echo that. But, um, I think like just the past year of building this company has all been a hurdle. Um, I think about being in China uh, last year, um, last semester, and I had to ask that question like, yo, you about to get your MBA in international business, like what do you want to do with your life in? Um, honestly, you know, getting I had to get out of my own way because there was an opportunity that obviously presented itself to where like I always wanted to have my own company. And it was that time, but I was fighting God, you know, and I was telling him, man, I'm not ready yet. You know, like, this is going to be a jump, and I was getting married, and, you know, life was about to hit me, you know, in a whole new circle. Um, I was coming back, and, like, obviously, the bills don't stop, like, life still moves. And so it was just like, am I going to be ready or capable to, you know, fight this fight for the first year in order to learn this company? And I'm glad that, like, God was just like, yo, just trust me, and everything out because honestly if I didn't do that I would have still been in China and possibly you know missing out on this multi-billion dollar company that we're building so I think it's just like getting out of the way really. Thank you guys.
hope that this is good that I want to share. It has some of the best motivation. Yeah, some of the best motivation comes from rap and sandpaper. Right now, somebody sitting here, they didn't get that yes they wanted. Because you didn't get that yes, it doesn't mean that you don't get it in the future. So I want you guys to really grasp that. I want to wrap this up. I want to ask you guys the question you ask everybody that's ever at the top of the show. It's very important. If you were to know that person that's sitting in these chairs right now, or if you're somebody that's alumni that's in this building, or if you're somebody that they need to drop out of college, what advice would you give that person asking themselves the question of the podcast, school's over, now what? I think, uh, yeah, I'll go uh, just off the top. I think that I would just encourage every individual in this room to take risks. Uh, I literally took a risk of not knowing anybody in China, not, not, not even knowing the language. Like, I didn't know anything by going halfway around the world, and it literally changed my whole career, my whole trajectory. Um, so, like, just take risks. Um, and I think the other thing is just, like, always be present in any room, right? So, whether it's going into a room and it's a network and it's a whole bunch of old people, man, just be present. Let them know who you are. Like, you have... You, always have value to somebody, you just have to express it and you never know when that person is going to potentially open a, a door for you. So take risks and just be present. I, I would say go work in whatever industry you're thinking about working in, whatever you're interested in. So I heard somebody say they make clothes, they're innovative, because what they say? Whatever the clothing line, right? Go work for somebody with the clothing line because you'll find out it's not that glamorous and not that's not to like throw shade on anything, but it, you get to see the ins and outs. You get to see what works, what doesn't work. So even before I started my own company, so I've never worked for um, like corporate. I, I didn't even know the corporate talk. Like my clients would say like PTO and I never knew that stuff, but um, I went and worked for a gym for a year. And so some things I was like, okay, I like this. I don't like that. Mm, I would, you know how y'all, y'all would pick apart stuff. Y'all see like, well, I don't like this. I don't like when they do this. I don't like when they can't. But you'll get to see why they're doing stuff or what you would do differently. And so then you get to go flip that when you go do your own thing, if that's what you choose to do. But you get to see the ins and outs. And so the, the thing is with social media now, everything looks glamorous. It's supposed to. Like when you go look at my Instagram, that thing looks lit, right? <laughs> but it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of tears behind the scenes. It's a lot of like trial and error. I say failure is like the cheat code, right? You find out what doesn't work, and sometimes it's going to cost you money, sometimes it's going to cost you tears, disappointment, friends, but at least you find out this doesn't work, this works, oh, I like this in this industry, oh, they do this really well, I would do this a little differently. And so you find out exactly like what your niche is, and so that's how I found my niche when I say I open gyms, but it's specifically a personal training studio catered to women in weight management. I found my target audience. Because everybody doesn't need what you have to offer. You just have to find the people who will buy what you want and find those people who find it valuable. So like they said earlier, know the people in the room. It's like, if somebody comes to me, I let them talk, talk, talk. These are my goals. This is what I'm looking to accomplish. This is what the, the bad things that happened with my trainer before. And so then I can approach them in a way where this is where I add value in whatever you're looking for. So go work in the industry, go shadow somebody, go intern, okay? It may not always, you may not always get money from it, but at least you're getting like the cheat codes to see what works for you. Yeah, so uh, I graduated from Winston Salem with a degree in marketing. Uh, when I graduated, I went back to D.C. and I got an internship at the Department of Energy, and I hated it. I was in a cubicle for eight hours, punching numbers, listening to my supervisor, and it was just uh, a chaotic time for my life. Uh, so afterwards, I knew I wanted to get back to my community, and I started uh, mentoring and teaching in Southeast DC at Charles Hart Middle School. While I was there, I got exposed to all the students, just like yourselves, who had so many big dreams, so many ideas, and that motivated me to like push harder and be that up, that that motivational male in their life. So. Uh, graduated, uh, not graduated, but I transitioned to another job with the Bread for the City. It's a mental illness facility for the homeless and people who had mental illness. <laughs> that exposure right there, like, pushed me really hard. And then I knew I had to go to uh, build my business and 
Uh, entrepreneurship was really on my mind at that time, and I, I talked to Desmond about it, and the idea of battery exchange was cultivated, and I think the, the biggest challenge was just leaving my comfort zone and leaving the people that I loved here in, in uh, the States to travel abroad to really bring the idea to life. And that risk, that, that, that failure, that, that exposure really helped me to bring what we have, <clears throat> excuse me, now to you all to, to really use and for you guys to like learn from us. I think that's the biggest thing we want to bring to you all. You, we want you guys to learn from us. We want to learn from you as well. How can we become better? How can we motivate you? Because you have a bright future, you know what I'm saying? I know that the, the world looks dark. I know the news may, may make you crumble sometimes, but there's some positivity out there that we want you guys to know. That we are some black owners. We came from the same seat y'all sitting in right now, and we're gonna make a change together. So that's, that's all I have to say. Every single podcast we ever had, we're wrap this up right now. We always end it by saying, dream it, believe it, go out and get it. So right now I got 21 countries that's listening to this. So on the count of three, I need my alma mater to say, dream it, believe it, go out and get it. Y'all ready? All right. One, two, three. Dream it, believe it, go out and get it.